afternoon session. So it's a pleasure to welcome Professor Nathan Cutts as an invited speaker for our symposium. Um, Professor Cutts is the Yasuko Endo and Robert Bowles Professor of Applied Mathematics at the University of Washington. Um, where he has served as a department chair uh, for a long time from 20, 2007 to 2015. Um, he has a wide variety of range uh, of research interests ranging from neuroscience to fluid dynamics um, and from machine learning to dynamical systems. Uh, among his many contributions, uh, his, his work has pioneered the field of system identification and model discovery from data. Um, and the title of his talk today is Targeted Use of Deep Learning uh, for Physics-Informed Model Discovery. So welcome, Professor Cutts, and uh, please feel free uh, to, to start your presentation. Okay, great. Well, uh, hi everyone. I hope you're all doing well. It's uh, it's it's always nice to catch up with friends, even if, even if it is just a Zoom chat <laughs> quickly. Uh, so usually I think about myself as being very sick of Zoom, but then I see some people I haven't seen for a while, and it's always uh, really pleasant to to see them. So Anuj, Michael, really great to see you guys, and uh, I hope everybody uh, is enjoying this the the workshop so far. And I really uh, appreciate being here. Um, so this is, you know, this this talks about sort of this this idea of, of physics informed machine learning broadly, and really the way I want to frame this is thinking about how do we target the use of neural nets so that we can retain some of what we really value a lot in physics, which is oftentimes this idea of interpretable models, right? Is this idea of, of having models that you can explain and you kind of know the different uh, mechanisms, and that's in some sense the uh, the, the, the way we think about physics is that we have that, that's the, uh, it, that we have these models and we wanna to try to learn those. So this work is with Steve Brunton and uh, really what I'm gonna to illustrate to you is a bunch of uh, works of our students and postdocs. And so I'm gonna highlight those as we go. They're, they're really the stars of this and I'm just the spokesman for them. And, uh, and I'll kind of demonstrate some of the things that they've been doing. So first, I want to start off with a perspective. Um, the way I'm going to frame everything in this talk is around this two concepts of thinking about discovering coordinates and dynamics somehow jointly. And of course, this is nothing new. We've been doing this in physics forever in our modeling, but now we have new tools to do it. And so I'm going to think about taking input data, learning some coordinate transform into some dynamics and then building models there. And the idea, and of course, I've already set this up with a deep neural net, so you know that's where I'm gonna take this. But really these ideas, you can use a lot of other methods besides deep neural nets. So let's first talk about this first portion, which is we wanna discover coordinates. Well, there are different ways to do this and we've always exploited good coordinates. In fact, the whole, growth of special functions that happened in the late 1800s, 1900s, was to exploit geometries. There's Bessel functions, Hermite, Laguerre, spherical harmonics. What they were were these, function, these special functions that were really built for certain geometries of physics. And they were, they were kind of the right variables to be using. And so we've been using that idea for a long time. And then you would build the model within that nice coordinate system. We also have a lot of expert knowledge. And so people have formulated a lot of this. Uh, through expert knowledge of a system. And more recently, we started have started using data-driven methods. And one of the oldest ones is just based upon the singular value decomposition. Um, and in fact, the singular value decomposition is kind of fascinating because it's been redeveloped <laughs> in so many different fields and they don't talk to each other and they all came up with different names for what was basically the SVD. There is the proper orthogonal decomposition, which was basically the SVD for fluid dynamics. There was the principal component analysis, which many of you are familiar with, which was, you know, a little variation of SVD. You, you know, you make the, the data mean zero unit variance. EOFs came out of the atmospheric science community. They're empirical orthogonal functions, Holtling transform. There are many other names. And so this tells you a little bit about the power of this technique. If all these fields invented the same thing and they just called them different, they didn't even know that they were kind of inventing the same thing. It tells you something that really important about that method. Um, the SVD is a linear reduction. And more recently we've really moved towards nonlinear reductions. And this buys us a lot more flexibility in a way. And I'm just naming two of them here. One of them is this method called the fusion maps that people have been using. It's a way to embed data in some 
a coordinate system, not only a coordinate system that's advantageous or neural networks. And that's kind of one of the things we're gonna look at a little bit here. Now, once you learn a coordinate system, what do you do with it? Well, now you have to prescribe dynamics in that coordinate. And there's so many different architectures here. And there's a, a lot of classic statistical methods for time series analysis. Like for instance, I just put there ARIMA. This is kind of your generic statistical time series method for autoregressive moving averages, right? Uh, so you, you can do something like that to predict the future state of the system. And more recently, there's a lot more, there's a growth around building more specialized dynamic models, something like dynamic mode decomposition and Koopman decompositions. What these are are regressions to the best fit linear dynamical system that is there. Uh, I've worked there. Michael Mahoney has some work here recently as well. There's also nonlinear models, parsimonious nonlinear models. This, this is this what's called the Cindy architecture, which is the sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics. I'll talk more about that as we go through. You can also try to use more dynamical systems theory, which is try to encode it into a normal form. I'll talk about the normal forms later as well. Or you can build another neural network there. You can just simply say, once I have it in this subspace, I have time series data. Why don't I just learn some kind of, take one of these, you know, recurrent neural networks or LSTM, GRU, echo state. You, there's all kinds of different neural networks that can learn a map taking you from time t to time t plus delta t. So there's a lot of different things you can do both on the coordinate and the dynamic side. So uh, that's kind of a, a high level pitch of trying to bring these two ideas together, which is the dynamics and coordinates. And then what I want to start to do is figure out how do I learn both though together? How do I pair these to make it very advantageous for me? So the first thing I have to understand is what do I mean by good coordinates? When I say this, it's a completely subjective language, right? Good coordinates. You know, good coordinates to me doesn't mean it's good coordinates to you, but I'm going to try to specify what I mean by good coordinates. And I go back to my initial slide. So my first slide had this in the background. And what you're seeing here is a picture of the night sky. This is the planet Mars, and it's, this is the retrograde motion of Mars in the night sky taken over a pretty long period of time. And here is the retrograde motion of Saturn. And one of the great physics problems of all time was the ability to try to understand what was governing the dynamics and to make predictions of the future state of the planets, right? So the ancients always were really trying to understand this. You know, the Greeks, they called these planets by Roman gods' names because somehow they were recurrent and they had these interesting structure and people wanted to predict these paths of the planets. The first theory, the first successful theory that took hold on this came out of Alexandria, Egypt. Ptolemy, the general of Alexander the Great, upon Alexander's death, took off and went down to Alexandria, Egypt, where he took over Alexandria, Egypt. And then once he was there, he started the Ptolemaic dynasty. Out of that dynasty, in the second century AD, came uh, Claudius Ptolemy, who built the doctrine of the perfect circle. So the idea of the doctrine of the perfect circle was this idea that the retrograde motion could ex be explained by circles on circles. So these are all these perfect circles, uh, basically spinning around on each other with different frequencies. And so you could represent the whole thing uh, in a very nice way with this. And in fact, there's these beautiful uh, Renaissance paintings, right, that show this. Uh, so from about 200 AD all the way to the 1600s, this was the theory. It was amazing theory. And one way to think about it, it was the first version of a Fourier transform, right? Represent everything as a sum of frequencies. That's it. Now, what brought this down? What brought this down was observation, measurement, and a coordinate change. From Copernicus, who suggested that in fact, the whole system makes a lot more sense if we move to a heliocentric coordinate system, to Kepler and Galileo pushing this idea to its logical conclusion. In fact, Kepler was the first to really lay down the mathematical foundations while Galileo with his observational data from the telescope, were able to basically 
really put firmly in place the heliocentric coordinate system. And by the way, part of the way that this was done is that Kepler had Tycho Brock's data. And that data was an order of magnitude more accurate than anything that had been collected up to that time. And that's what allowed Kepler to formulate his planetary laws. And it was this coordinate system, this change of coordinates to the heliocentric world that then allowed Newton to develop his F equals MA, gravitation laws in the right coordinate system. And in fact, if you don't have the right coordinate system, it's not clear what Newton does at that point, right? Because it's really the natural coordinate system is the heliocentric coordinate system to explain the motion of the planets. Now, here's what's interesting about this story. We think we have it nailed down, but really in the late uh, 1800s, early 1900s, improved observational data. Again, right, we go right to the data. As you get better and better data, it was noticed that there was a discrepancy between Galileo's gravitational law, uh, sorry, Newton's gravitational laws and actual observation of the planets. And so at first they thought we're missing a planet. There's a planet somewhere that's responsible for making these discrepancies. That wasn't true. What was true was that these improved measurements showed, and this was the work of Einstein, that in fact, gravity had a much more important effect than we first believed, which is it locally warped space time. And so this was the genesis of, of uh, general relativity, which explained this. And the only reason we got that is through improved observation. Undoubtedly, I put a picture here on the right. Someone, someone's gonna be in that frame someday. As we get better and better data, someone will come and say, Einstein wasn't quite right. My observations now that are so fine and so refined are showing me that I'm missing some physics. And with that data, we may be able to improve on general relativity. So this process to me is really the important thing, coordinates with the model that comes after. So let's go back to the paradigm I talked about. So here's the basic paradigm I wanna focus in on throughout the rest of this talk. Remember, I drew this neural network, right? Which is learn coordinates, learn dynamics. So let's put this in context of this example I just gave for planetary motion. Your original observation is from the earth of retrograde motion, which is sort of in some sense, this picture here, circles on circles. That was the uh, Ptolemaic system. But as I take, if I, what I really want this coordinate transformation to learn is that, well, that's the wrong coordinate system. If I just move my center of the coordinate system to the sun, everybody's an ellipse around the sun. And then once I have that coordinate system, then I can learn this gravitational law, one, uh, one over root, uh, square root inverse uh, radius law. So that's the idea of what we're trying to do in this neural network. Let me give you one more example of this just to clarify it. So here we go. This is a pendulum. We stuck this in a wall here at the University of Washington. And you can tell this is a state university because look at the off-white color walls with the off-white color floors with the off-white color ceilings. <laughs> They're super boring and as the cheapest materials you could probably find. But that means you could drill a hole and put a pendulum in there. Now, what's interesting about the pendulum is I give you a video of the pendulum. That's your data. Now, you know, and I know that if I were to write this data down, I'd have to, I'd have to write it in theta, theta dot coordinates, right? But the, the, it's a video. So the first thing this neural network has to learn is the coordinate embedding. Once it can learn that coordinate embedding, then you can learn the physics of that model in the right coordinates frame. So this is what this paradigm is trying to do. In fact, I'll show you later, this is exactly an example we did in this kind of neural network structure. Oh, and by the way, for those of you who are engineers, I'm gonna show you a page of your nightmare homework sets, statics and dynamics. If you took statics and dynamics, you know that there's two sets of courses, sum of forces equals zeros, sum of forces equals MA, and the whole trick, if you actually go back and look what you did, the entire trick of that course, you knew the governing equations, your whole trick was to put together the right coordinate system. That was it. Your, your, your whole job in all of these problems here was to draw the right free body diagram, 
and then either sum of forces equals zero or sum of forces equals ma. That's it. So even here in statics and dynamics, I'm not telling you anything new. You've been doing this the whole time, which is write the right coordinate system, then do my physics in governing equations. The advantage you had here in statics and dynamics is you knew the governing equations. And part of what we want to do is discover the governing equations along with the coordinates. So let's return back to Kepler and Newton before we really get into the mathematical architecture, which is there's this interesting, I think their stories have a very uh, meaningful statement for us today. So what Kepler did is he took the best data of his day, which was Tycho Brock's, and was able to regress to ellipses. He did this by hand, right? There was no MATLAB, no Python, Jupyter notebooks. He had to do this all by hand, right? Um, with a bunch of missing data, right? So back then missing data meant, oh, it's cloudy out. I can't make an observation. So you'd skip a number of days until you could make observations. You make observations. And so it wasn't as clean as today where we have ways to sort of interpolate and we have MATLAB, we could do all this stuff. This is all by hand. And with that, he was able to produce these elliptic orbits that were fits to the data. Now, Newton, once he proposes his F equals MA law and does it for the planets, he solves that and he finds that the solutions are ellipses. So what's the difference? Newton got the same solutions that Kepler did. The difference is that Newton's F equals MA can be used to extrapolate. So now that you have this F equals MA model, you can imagine sending a rocket to the moon, landing a lander, collecting some soil samples, bring it back to Earth. All that's done because, and by the way, we never had data for that. We never observed it and said, okay, now I can learn a model for it. We had a model that we learned, this F equals MA, and from it, we extrapolated to do this operation, which was a remarkable feat of human ingenuity. And I don't know how many of you are so excited about seeing these pictures from Mars, but I, it's so awesome to see these HD pictures from the surface of Mars, right? Um, the only thing missing on Mars is they needed like a Chipotle there uh, and, or something like a spa, a Chipotle, something fun to do. Right now it's just desert, but it's pretty cool too. So, um, so by the way, where does the, this uh, kind of idea of Kepler and Newton come in today? I think of it here, which is you have two of the dominant, you know, grand challenge problems of our day. One is, uh, they're both autonomy challenges. One is a robot and the other is a self-driving car. And in some sense, I would say that there's a big fundamental difference how they operate, right? So this robot, which is amazing from Boston Dynamics, it is a physics driven engine underneath it. So that robot is built, its whole mechanics for movement is built around understanding forces, mass, momentum, angular momentum, and that's how it's able to operate. Whereas the self-driving car, its entire driving structure is built off banks of sensors. And what they've done is taken enough data to turn the self-driving problem into an interpolation problem. But it's really remarkable what that self-driving car can do. Both paradigms are extremely successful in today's modern world but they have very different architectures and how they view the world. One is a physics-based model. One, there's no physics, just lots of lots of data. And by the way, this is the power of having a lot of money. If you're Google or Facebook is you can basically buy a workforce of people to uh, basically, you know, go and annotate your data so that you can build an interpolation training set. Right. And that's, that's a, that's a, I don't know how many dollars we've spent doing that, but that is a massive challenge. And that's what's necessary to build a, uh, a, a something like a self-driving car in this modern world. By the way, I'm not gonna try to put any value judgment on either architecture. I think they're obviously both very successful. And I can't, you can't argue that one is more successful than another. They have, each has their place. Um, each can argue that one is better than the other. And, but what I will say is that I'm going to probably, I'm going to focus more on the top. I want to think about bringing back interpretability, extrapolation potential, learning physics laws from the data itself.
Okay, so let's get down to the mathematical formulation. Um, that was a long intro, but I'm, I'm hoping that what it highlighted were a lot of the concepts that I think we need to bring to the table today as modern data scientists trying to do physics, so the physics informed platform. So here's the, here's the mathematical framework. I have some dynamics and I have measurements of that dynamics. So the measurement is what I have access to. This is this Y of T of K. In other words, I measure at different discrete time points, some version of X through a measurement model. I don't even necessarily know what the measurement model is. When I measure, I have noise. And then what I'm trying to measure is some dynamical system where I don't know the dynamics, which are prescribed by F. I don't even know necessarily what the state space X is or its parameters are. So what I have here is a, uh, is a system is that what I want to do is from the measurements alone, Y of TK, discover H, F, theta, and dx dt equals f. This is a terribly ill-posed problem. And this is where I think the world has gotten exciting. When I was in graduate school, if someone said this is an ill-posed problem, you would stop right there. You'd say, well, obviously that means you can't solve it. So you go find something else to do your thesis on, right? I mean, we saw well-posed problems. And then as I've gotten more into sort of the statistics and machine learning literature, you know, ill posed just means, well, um, that's not a problem. Just regularize it, impose constraints, and make it well posed. So that's what we're doing. We're taking that philosophy and saying, I will take a problem I used to give up on and just impose a bunch of constraints on it until I can make it so that I can solve it. And of course, what we know is when we learn do deep learning is the regularizations matter a great deal. And so the question is, what are the regularizers we should bring to the table here for this physics-based models? And so here, here's, here's where I want to uh, uh, here's what I'll push for us, which is I want in physics-based models, I value interpretability and parsimony above all else. This is just, you know, me. There's others that think this way too, but you know, this is just an opinion, let's say, is how do I want to do this? I want to impose these. And these ideas are old. They go all the way back to William of Ockham, who actually formally proposed this idea of uh, nominal models, right? He was working in a logic era when, in fact, it, at Oxford uh, in the 1200s, where they were trying to build these very, very complicated logic models based on Aristotelian ideas. And he thought they were getting carried away. So he was just like, no, no, make nominal models, the fewest explanatory variables. That's what we should be using. He really advocated that idea all the way back then. Um, and you see it come up again and again through history. And one of the more famous ones I put out here is Pareto because we have this thing called the Pareto front. So Pareto was just balancing uh, model complexity with model accuracy. And so you can look at this balance between the two, and that's usually the Pareto frontier. And you put yourself at a spot where you kind of have good accuracy, yet have a pretty parsimonious model. So we're going to go after these same concepts in physics. Now, why would this any of this work in physics? Okay, so I'm actually in my office today. And up on my bookshelf over here, I have a bunch of physics and math books. And if you look at the governing equations on any one of these, they're pretty parsimonious, right? So I can you know, quantum mechanics has like three terms, you know, a potential term, you have a I psi of T plus a dis dispersion term plus a potential. In fact, you look across physics and it's all fairly simple. Why does this work? And part of the reason I would argue that it works is because most of this is based upon dominant balance physics. When you interact with the system at whatever scale you're measuring it at, you're basically observing the balance of some dominant physics terms. And this is how we get away with these very simplified models often. Navier-Stokes, for instance, three terms, yet it describes all this fluid dynamics. Um, so that's where I would argue is in physics, the reason this works for us, if we impose these kind of constraints, is it's really going after anytime something is manifest in nature, it's usually the balance of two or three terms. And that's what's causes the manifestation of some dynamics that you observe. So how do we do this? Well, there's a lot of different ways we can do it. And I'm going to start off with sort of model building and try to do different structures for this. 
The simplest thing to do potentially is just build a linear model, right? Because if I can build a linear model, in other words, find a coordinate transformation so that the dynamics is linear. And this is a, a really important and powerful concept because a linear model is easy, right? You just find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the linear model and you can say everything you want about it. So here's a simple example to show how this might work out. On the top left, what you have here is a nonlinear two by two ODE. Here's what the nonlinearity is. It's this x1 squared. And you just say, well, you know, if you're doing your standard uh, differential equations background, you might say, well, it's nonlinear. So I should just, you know, look for the fixed points, calculate the stability and sketch a phase plane. But the illustration here is I could trade this system out to the following, these new variables, y1, y2, y3. And in that new variable set, this system is exactly linear. And so I have a better coordinate system. I don't work with the original coordinate system. I move to this coordinate system. And now I have a linear embedding in this space. So this is the idea behind Koopman theory. Koopman theory is about, can I move to a new variable set where the dynamics is linear? And of course, Koopman never gave us a, a recipe for how to do that. And we're still struggling with that today. But one of the powerful methods to try to get this coordinate system to make things linear is a neural network. <coughs> and uh, I always like to give uh, Stefan Malat's quote here about supervised learning, <coughs> because he has one key word in here that everybody should always just keep in mind, interpolation, right? So. When we take data and we're gonna learn, we have to just remember that we're in an interpolated setting and it's not clear we can extrapolate outside of that, right? If we get lucky, we might, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on. So what do we want neural net to do? So this is work with Bethany Lush. Bethany is now at Argonne National Labs. And when, we, when she was here, we were trying to figure out, okay, let's do a simplest nonlinear dynamical system possible, which is the nonlinear oscillator. So you take a pendulum, nonlinear pendulum. So instead of doing the linearizing approximation of the pendulum, it's just x double dot is equal to sine x. Okay, so that's your model. And the question is, could we in fact learn a coordinate embedding to make that linear? So we start off with an input data. We have an encoder that transform me from the x variable to y. Y is a new latent variable. And, and then I want to get, be able to get back out. And what I want this encoder and decoder to do is when I'm in this new coordinate system, the dynamics should be linear. So in other words, when I go from y of k to y of k plus one, it should just be a linear map. Okay, I just hit it with a matrix. And notice what I've done here. I'm doing more than, I'm also keeping this pinched down to the intrinsic dimensionality of the system. In other words, I know this pendulum is two dimensional theta, theta dot, keep it that way. Learn a map, keep it at that dimension, and let's see how it works out. All right, well, we failed. In fact, one thing that I learned about neural networks is that I can fail in so many new ways. You know, before I was a little felt more constrained. I could fail certain ways, or this could happen, or that could happen. But the infinity of ways I could fail with a neural network really blew my mind. I was amazed. So anyway, if any of you are new at training neural networks, be prepared to fail a lot. And that's okay. I just want you to know it's okay. <laughs> it's not like you're not good at it, you're bad at it, I, or maybe I'm just bad at it. But I failed so many times with this. Um, and it took a while to figure out why the failures happened. And the reason I say obviously here at the end is because after we finally figured out what was going wrong, it was so obvious why it was <laughs> not working. So it's, that's another nice little point. Uh, you know, you're going to embarrass yourself, embarrass yourself once in a while in learning these things, but that's fine. So here was what's wrong. Uh, let's talk about the nonlinear uh, nonlinear pendulum. Here is the approximation when I just take that sine of x and I do an expansion. So it's I get a cubic correction to the nonlinear pendulum, and then you ask the question. This is the duffing oscillator, okay? And that's the first nonlinear approximation to the linear pendulum. And you ask, what does that cubic do? Well, it turns out we've known what that has done for a long time. We've done a lot of asymptotic and perturbation methods. And we've learned that, in fact, that cubic nonlinearity does two things and two things only. It shifts the frequency of the oscillation and it generates harmonics. 
And in fact, if you do a perturbation expansion, here's your solution. You can see here the shift in the frequency and notice here the correction, which is uh, you get a generation of harmonics. So in fact, I can just solve this numerically and show you this. This is as in the x-axis is a function of the amplitude. As the amplitude gets bigger, notice the shifting frequency right here. That's your dominant frequency, it's shifting. Here's your third harmonic right here. Here's your fifth harmonic, there's a seventh. We've known this for a long time, but notice once you know this, it is kind of interesting that I was trying to embed this in a two by two system, which was only capable for oscillatory dynamics of an eigenvalue pair, which is plus I omega and minus I omega and look at all the omegas I would need. So I can't do it unless I change the structure of my neural network, which is what I really need to do is I can keep this two dimension in, but my Koopman operator or my linear embedding is now parametrized by the frequency. So if I do that, I can now easily embed this. And this is just handling the continuous spectrum of a differential equation. That's the mathematical way to think about it. So now we could take this and here it is. So I have my nonlinear pendulum and we're gonna look at oscillations all the way up to when it's in the upright position, which is the saddle. And here's the phase plane, theta, theta dot right there. Here's the dynamics. You can see the frequency shifts as the amplitude oscillations get bigger. They start to look less and less sinusoidal. They're kind of pretty warped sin, uh, periodic structures. Here's the phase plane, but at the bottom here is once we've embedded it into this coordinate system, it's perfectly linear. And here is the coordinates, the eigenfunction transformation to this coordinate system from this neural network. So this allows you then with this parametrization of that neural net, allows you to move to take that entire nonlinear dynamical systems and embed it in a linear way. We can do harder problems like flow around the cylinder. Here it is. So this is again, when you have von Karman vortex shedding. And when you look at the dynamics of this, it starts to create, uh, uh, there's basically like a Hoff bifurcation off the back of this. So you get periodic dynamics governed by some nonlinear ODEs uh, that people have actually been able to drive. But you can take this whole thing, linearize it. So now you can describe all of this dynamics in the appropriate coordinate system as just linear dynamics. And here is the linear dynamic embedding. So that's the kind of power of what a Koopman operator can do for you in, in, this, kind of, uh, in this kind of framing. Now we started to try to ramp this up. And this is work with Craig Jinn. And this one here, I'm still kind of surprised we were able to do, frankly. <laughs> so I didn't ever think we could do this, but uh, we, were, we were, again, building on this theme. We started to look, and I'm gonna highlight the model we looked at. We looked at the, what's called the kuramoto shivashinsky PDE. And this has spatial temporal chaos. It's a very complicated system to get. It's, it's got really cool patterns that develop in it. It's got nice dynamics, but it's spatial temporal chaos. And the question is, could you embed that in a linear system? And in fact, we did. We trained a much more complicated network, now architecture, but we went from the U variable to some latent space V, tried to build a linear map. And in fact, what you're showing, what I'm showing you here on the right is in this column is the exact solution. And this column is now the neural network approximation to this. This is just linear dynamics in this new variable system. And then I decode it. And you can see if I train it with enough trajectories, so know that I've really mapped out, I have to make this like an interpolation problem. I have to look at lots of different trajectories. Then I can actually train this so that I have a linear model in there and it can describe all the dynamics of the full nonlinear dynamics with a linear model in the right coordinate system. So by the way, all this code's available. Everything I'm talking about, the whole talk long, uh, you can download everything, right? You can, it's on GitHub's, all the data's on GitHub's, all the model data we put on GitHub. So anything here you can reproduce. So uh, that, notice that all of this was warping space. Like, let me find a coordinate system in spatially in which the dynamics is linear in time. But this doesn't stop us from warping time itself. So we did this with this Fourier Koopman forecasting trick. <clears throat> and the idea here is to build a Koopman operator, but now in time. 
So what we like about four emotes, they're simple to understand. And how many functions do you know when you walk them out to infinity, don't blow up or go to zero? Very few. <laughs> but sines and cosines are perfect. You can take it to infinity and they're really well behaved. And so when I want to do long-term forecasting, they're kind of the perfect functions for it. So you can cook this up to learn a loss function and use sines and cosines. In fact, use a parsimonious set and it works really well. But then we start saying, yeah, but what about signals like this? This is like some kind of, you know, when you have sharp things, it's not built, it's not very amenable to Fourier modes, right? Because you need a lot of them. So what we said is, let's learn a neural network. This is Henning who did this, hanging long, long here. And this is coming out in Journal of Machine Learning Research, or it should be out there like soon or is out now. What we did is said, how about this? Let's, just like we were warping space, let's warp time. And we'll learn a neural network coordinate transformation to warp the time variable so that we turn these things as sinusoidal as possible and use as few sinusoids as we need. So it's gonna take all this data, warp it, make it look sinusoidal, and then I can do my forecasting there and bring it back. How well does this work? Well, we took some power grid data and power grid is actually surprisingly difficult to forecast, right? It's, it looks kind of regular, but it's irregular <laughs> as it goes through. So forecasting is very difficult with it, but we did some long range forecasting with it. And I just want to show you the results here. This Koopman forecasting trick, uh, we compared it against two different paradigms. We compared it against what you might do today with deep neural nets, which is LSTM, GRU, Echo State Networks. We beat all of them handily. We also compared it against your standard statistical methods, ARIMA, auto ARIMA, like there's a bunch of different time series methods that are out there too. So we took classical statistics methods, deep learning methods, we put them all together and compared against this Koopman forecast. And for long-term forecasting, it's remarkably great. I mean, it really just destroys the others. LSTMs and these, these other neural network-based tricks are really great for short-term forecasting. They'll give you very amazing accuracy one delta t into the future, but we were looking for, give me the prediction many delta t's into the future. And if you do that, this is where this thing works. And in part, because the physics inform part of it. I'm using the right functions. I'm using sines and cosines, but in a warped coordinate system. So it really plays out nicely here. Where does this play a nice role? Well, we started using this for model reduction. So if you do reduced order modeling, you might solve some PDEs and you might take the PDE, look for some low rank embedding and then do a Galerican projected model to, to do that's your ROM or the reduced order model. What we did instead is, okay, fine. Look at your low dimensional embedding. And then instead of doing a ROM, just simply take this method and Koopman forecast it and then project back up into the original coordinate system. So here, this is the future state prediction and this is the ground truth. And here's your prediction from this. It's amazingly accurate. It basically destroys these typical projective PDE tricks that you would do onto a low, low rank subspace. So I, I just think there's a lot of space here if you start using the right coordinates, the right embeddings of things. And this seems to be one of them. All right, so all of this, right, was thinking about learn a coordinate system, pair it with linear dynamics and time in some sense, or learn a way to warp time to make it linear. In other words, Fourier mode expansions in time. We can also just say, well, let's just go out and strictly keep it with governing equations that could be nonlinear. But I want parsimony, because that was one of my objectives right at the beginning is to have parsimonious representations. So the base model here we go after is the Cindy architecture. It's called sparse identification and nonlinear dynamics. The mathematics of it is very simple. It's AX equal to B. And I always just tell everybody, it's just AX equal to B, an overdetermined system. And the only thing you're doing here is saying, give me a sparse solution, promote sparsity on the solution. So let's talk about how this works. I have a system and it generates some time series data for here it's the Lorentz system. So I don't know what the system was, but you give me time series data for X, Y, and Z. Now, if I have X, Y, and Z, and I don't know the x dot equals f of x that produced that. Well, 
you gave me the data, I can produce x dot. Okay, I just need to know the f of x. So the x dot is the b, and on the right hand side, the a matrix is here, is a library of potential right hand side terms. In other words, I say, well, what could, what could the right hand, what could f of x be? Well, what I'm allowed to do is posit a whole bunch of different possibilities. Here I've just shown you polynomials, but there's no need to restrict yourself to polynomials. You can put sines, cosine, polynomials. We even found ways to write down like things like cosine omega x, where you can determine omega in the regression process itself, some parametrized version of it. But right here again, since I'm in my office, my bookshelf has a bunch of models, dynamic models. And I can just say, well, go look at my bookshelf, pull out everything I've seen, put it into that library as a potential right-hand side term. So that's the matrix A. So the matrix A is the potential terms. B is the derivatives of the time series. So all I got to do is solve A x equal to B through regression. And what I want to do is promote sparsity. In other words, out of all those library terms, the fundamental belief is only a few of those terms matter. So promote sparsity. And what you're seeing here is those dots are the ones that are non-zero. And in fact, it gives you back exactly the Lorenz equations. So what you're allowing yourself to do is just do this sparse regression. And there's different architectures for doing the sparse regression. You know, for those of you from statistics, lasso is sort of your standard like sparse regressor, but uh, you don't want to use lasso here. It's too unstable, but we've developed some other methods that are like lasso, but much, much more stable. You can fix this up to do PDEs as well. So here you go. So here's a bunch of PDEs. So I have spatial temporal data. You give me spatial temporal data, do the regression, and you can rediscover the governing equations. So this is remarkable, right? I can measure vorticity of a fluid flow, take that data, time series data, do a regression, and it would discover the Navier-Stokes equations for you, which is, I think that's kind of a remarkable feat. So this is work with Sam Rudy, who really took this into the PDE world. And Sam also followed this up with, finding ways to denoise the data as well. In other words, to separate dynamics from noise processes, then do model discovery there. So I'll just say that because these, these methods are sensitive to noise, but we've worked pretty hard since the original papers to handle noise. And by the way, if you don't like the sparse regression framework, you can go towards a full Bayesian uh, formulation of this Cindy modeling which is again, here it is. You have your data, you can fill in your library, but now you have your library terms. Now what you do, instead of just doing sparse regression, you actually do Monte Carlo here and with these regressors and you say, okay, let me take the data. Let me take some of the models I might have here, do some regressions. And now I'm gonna get a probability, oops, a probability distribution for each of the loading parameters. So now what you're gonna get is an inclusion probability for this. And the kind of priors that we use for those modeling, uh, for, these, for these is a spike and slab prior. So within this framework, you can actually get not just, is it zero or some number, you get a PDF, like, right? That's, that's the answer. Like if, you're, if you ask a Bayesian question, the answer is always a PDF at the end, right? So you get these PDFs and it clearly shows you the terms that sort of are important and their probability distributions. The real advantage of this method in particular is that when you do this Bayesian regression, you can do it with very short amount of data and actually pretty large noise, uh, much better than the Cindy architecture I showed you earlier. This is amazing how much noise it can handle and still pretty much get you the right answer. And this is work with Seth Hirsch, who actually just graduated this last year. So, all right. But here's where I actually believe the biggest impact will be of something like this Cindy architecture is on discrepancy modeling. So instead of starting from scratch, we actually know a lot of physics most of the time, right? We actually have a model that we know like, hey, I'm doing this system and this system has conservation of mass, conservation of momentum. Here's some other things I know. Like we've studied physics for a long time, not just me and you, but all the people who came before us. We've built a body of knowledge it is absolutely ridiculous to throw it away. What you do is you start with how much information do I have? So I have part of my model, but I'm missing some physics. 
I need to find that. So notice how easy this is to fit in the Cindy framework. Well, if you know f of x is there, move it to the left-hand side. It's now part of b. And then you do your ax equal to b. And now your library of functions is only aimed at finding the g of x. So you're just finding the missing physics. And you and by the way, you can also impose within this ax equal to b framework, suppose I have a conservation law. Well, then you have ax equal to b with a subject two line. So you try to regress on that and enforce this subject two line that you have with it. So there's a lot of architecture, uh, architectural features that are very nice here. So where is this important? Well, here's some models that I think this might be important on. So what you're seeing up top is a double pendulum on a cart. And basically, it has platonic knowledge of the physics. In other words, it believes the world is perfect. It, has, it knows its mass and lengths. And it can't stabilize the pendulum in the right upright position. On the bottom, however, what you do with the bottom one is you say, here's the platonic model. But now you get to collect data and compare it to your model and make improvements. And now you can stabilize this thing, right? That's the kind of thing that will matter for us. And it's especially important here, I think, for the digital twin revolution, which is everybody's moving towards a digital twin, right? Which is basically saying, I have a simulation of my system, which we've been doing forever, but now it has a fancy name, right? Digital twin. Um, so here's your real robot. Here's the fake robot. But you want to put this in some factory and you want this thing somehow to be a true representation of the physics. Well, it turns out your CAD-based SIM model isn't accurate enough to do precision manufacturing that this thing needs to do. However, if you have sensors on here and you have your ideal model, you could learn the discrepancy between them. You can learn, in fact, I have a little bit of stick in this joint. There's a little bit of uh, friction over in this joint. You could learn all these things so that now your CAD model has it built and you can make it adaptive. So for instance, if someone comes along and oils this machine, you change the discrepancy model. <clears throat> and notice that every single robot would have a different discrepancy model. So you need a flexible framework that's adaptable that builds beyond your platonic model. So I think this is a really nice future state of this. So notice in this, by the way, that I assumed at this point uh, uh, that in fact, I've, I, I actually had the full state of the system in the right coordinate system, but now I want to move towards something new, which is thinking about back to the beginning, which is dynamics and coordinates, which is, okay, what if I just have data? How would I set this up to do Cindy, but also I'll discover coordinates at the same time. And this is work with Kathleen Champion. Kathleen did this. I, I really like what Kathleen did for her thesis. What she did is said, let's learn a coordinate system. And what do I want to have happen in the coordinate system? What I showed you before was linear dynamics. Now we just build that Cindy model right in the middle there. Here's your loss function. Uh, and once you do this, you actually can now say, I want to pair a coordinate system with a parsimonious model. And by the way, my first slides that I showed earlier, this is exactly the idea. So if I have measurements of the retrograde motion of the planets, right? learn to put it in a heliocentric coordinate system and then do f equals ma in there or the one that she did here she did the pendulum you observe a pendulum and actually here's the example that we did some others but really the focus on the bottom one here here is the trajectory of a pendulum the pendulum data is in pixel space it it has to learn there's a theta theta dot and then it can learn theta double dot is negative sine theta and it does so that's a, I think that's a really remarkable trick. And by the way, the reason I think this one is so important is because if you enter the field of like biology, like it, it's one thing where I give a lot of my examples and you say, well, I kind of knew those governing physics to begin with. So you're just testing your method on something I knew. But the places where I think we're going to make big impact is places like biology, where we don't have first principle models oftentimes. And we're just going to have to say like, okay, now I have this data. Can I discover the right coordinate system for the data? and discover some underlying dynamic processes that are happening. And this is an architecture allowing you to do that. We can do more than that. Uh, and this is a paper that will go up on the archive pretty soon, which is one thing is to learn this 
parsimonious representation, but oftentimes what people in dynamical systems do, like myself, is you'd say, yeah, but that's a form of the equation, but what I really want is a parametric representation in its canonical form. So we make these what are called normal form transformations, because in fact, most physics systems have only a discrete finite number of ways that they exhibit instability and are parametric in their representation. So these normal forms are like saddle nodes, pitchfork, bifurcations, transcriptal, Hoff. And we can, instead of learning governing equations, we go one step further to learn these normal form embeddings. And so that's what we we're able to do there. And then we did this monoclea. And you can even go one step beyond that to learn what are called deep conjugacies of mappings. So this is getting really heavy into dynamical systems, but these concepts out of dynamical systems are so um, pervasive. They're, they're sort of this underlying fundamental building blocks of all physics. You can write a representation of the dynamics, but through some appropriate set of coordinates, it comes down to some very simple mathematical architecture at the end. And so you can see these are coordinates upon coordinates upon coordinates. It's kind of like that movie Inception. How many coordinate systems are you in? Because <laughs> now we're down to these very fundamental ideas uh, that come out of dynamical systems. Uh, just a comment about generalizability. Here there it is. Uh, the neural network itself is not generalizable. So if I took a video of a pendulum and I make the pendulum twice the length, well, the neural network doesn't work for that new <laughs> twice length pendulum. However, if I learn theta double dot is negative sine theta, that does work for both. So there's this interesting thing here that I think still needs to be built out, which is how do you start using these together to build yourself a, a way to generalize by saying, well, if I have the right physics, I should be able to go to a new coordinate system, apply the same physics. So all the pressure now is just learning new coordinates and not on learning the model. By the way, that's your statics and dynamics course. If you took statics and dynamics, you always had F equals MA. You always had the right model. You just had to learn a new coordinate system for every single problem you did, right? Because it wasn't generalizable. Some couple of notes to finish up. You can do multi-scale physics, take advantage of multi-scale physics architectures. Neural networks are so flexible. So this is work with Yu Ying Lu. And we really built on the concept of multi-grid methods out of computational physics, which is refine your computation where the error is large. It's exactly what you do. A convolutional neural network with coarse grain picture. And wherever the error is big, you, that's where you refine your convolutional neural network. And you can use the neural networks from one level to the next. So it's got transfer learning and a multi-grid architecture. Uh, so this is kind of a, a, a way that we've done multi-scale physics in the past. And we're just building it right into the neural networks. We can also do boundary value problems. Everything I've talked about is time dependent, but there's a big class of problems that are boundary value problems. Same architecture. Learn a coordinate transformation <coughs> to a representation that's advantageous and come back. And in this, you have a boundary value problem. This is work with Dan Shea. And we did this actually to learn Green's functions, nonlinear Green's functions. So those of you who are familiar with Green's functions, right? Green's functions are basically this fundamental solution to boundary value problems. They only work for linear boundary value problems. But here, what we do is we can learn a mapping from the original for nonlinear boundary problems by learning a mapping to a new coordinate v, and we learn the forcing of that function, forcing of that boundary value problem to a new coordinate f. And we, and we learn these embeddings, these two neural networks, so that in the new coordinates, I have a linear boundary value problem. I can find the Green's function and then come back. So there you go. So all these ideas work across. And, and, and we're trying to go back towards all these classic physics models, that, methods that people use. All of them can be fixed up to be using targeted use of neural nets. So that's where I want to end. Um, I, I, I'd like to make this statement, right, that parsimony, in my view, was the regularizer we used, right? I presented to you an ill posed problem. And the way I solved all of these problems I presented to you is by basically promoting parsimony. And so I always think of it as sort of this ultimate physics regularization tool. Um, you know, and just it's just an opinion, right? I mean, everybody's going to have a different opinion about 
how to do these things. And so, and by the way, nobody should take anything too seriously from this. This is just a method, methods we've been working on. And it's an outlook that it could be advantageous for the problem you look at, right? Um, but it, there, is, there is definitely something to be gained from this in many problems. And so we took the opposed problem, promote, promoted parsimony, and really went throughout this talk with this kind of architecture here. And with that, we were able to do quite a bit of uh, scientific work. So I'll stop there. Thank you guys so much. All right, let's thank uh, Professor Kutz for the fascinating pr presentation and for giving us the entire trajectory, starting from Ptolemy or even before to, to, to the modern um, day work. Um, so audience, we, uh, we have time for a few questions. Um, Carlos, I think you have, um, you, you have a question. Um, would you like to just speak up? Sure, right. thank right. you. Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you, Pro Professor Kutz, for the great talk. Uh, I would like to ask you uh, the following. I have read some words that split the coordinate uh, discovery from the physics part. For example, uh, some words first implement an autoencoder to discover a, a proper latent space and then apply another architecture such as a group on the latent space independently to learn the physics part. Uh, should we really decouple these two steps, work independently with the first, the coordinate discovery, and then with the physics part? It depends on how, so different people do different things, but like for instance, on some of that, some people will just say, if I wanted to go and discover a coordinate system, you know, the easiest coordinate system to take high dimensional data to is just, do an SVD, put it in some long, low rank subspace. And now everything's temporal dynamics there. And you just say, well, now I can use GRU, LSTMs, whatever I want there. So you don't have to think too hard about how do I construct a loss function to do something fancy with the embedding plus something fancy with the time step. For us, we knew exactly what we wanted the embedding to accomplish it's not clear to me how, what you would, okay. And actually, I think this is just, I don't have very good expertise in LSTMs or grooves. If you had good expertise in LSTMs and grooves, you might know exactly what you want that LSTM and groove to do that would be really advantageous. And then you can pose that loss function on that neural net. And so you wouldn't separate them. You just put them all together. I think in general, you want to basically build loss functions that, that, connect everything together. Okay, okay, thank you. I, I ask because uh, maybe an advantage of using an autoencoder is that take, for example, a comparison with the POD. With a POD, you produce an, a linear decomposition. So maybe you are going to need a lot of modes uh, depending on your problem to recover the variance on your data. But with an autoencoder, uh, when you apply a nonlinear transformation, you probably end with a half of the modes or uh, sorry, the, the half of the latent space, the, the dimension that, that you need. So uh, some people uh, use that because it is an advantage. You work with less information, but I, I like your explanation of the, of the coordinate and its relation with the fixes. So I, I think that maybe uh, it's better to work with, with what we know, like a POD and, and a Koopman operators and so on. Thank you very much for, for your answer. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, I have a question. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, very interesting talk, entertaining too. Uh, did you uh, happen to apply any combination of these to the problem you started with, namely, uh, planetary motion. Yeah. Okay. That's a great question. Cause, okay. So I found, uh, the Tableau Nouveau, which was Kepler's, it, it's this big book with all the data. And I found a PDF of it and I was thinking it would be awesome <laughs> to have this data, but it would mean I would have to transcribe it data set data by data to some excel sheet or something like this so i would love to do that eventually uh but it was one of these things where it's beyond my uh 
beyond my faint is when I looked at how thick the book was and all the data, I was like, dang, I bet someone's done this, but I couldn't find it anywhere on the internet. Sure, but that's that's a, a, I thought it would be, yeah. That's why we went with the pendulum, actually, for the example, because with the pendulum, we could actually, um, right, with the pendulum, we could actually just build it, film it, and it's like we, we had the data, all the data we needed. It, it, how about, very, yeah, oh. go ahead. Sorry, didn't mean to break you. So uh, how about some synthetic data, like just um, maybe create simulations of the ellipses and then do relative where you, you see all these uh, complicated curves. Have you tried that? No, we haven't tried that, but that, that's a great idea, right? Because it'd be easy enough to model it. it. It's actually interesting. I did finally find some data, but it was fairly limited. And it goes to this point that I'd made earlier, right, which was, if you actually look at Tycho Brock's data, it's it's kind of amazing, right? Because he'll have patches of a number of recordings in a row, and then like gaps of months. So, you know, they were he was traveling to the Austrian court, <laughs> and then he comes back, and then you know, and you could see like, oh, they had really bad weather for a while, and then all of a sudden they get a bunch of good weather, and you could just see because the recordings are basically based on if I go out tonight. And if it's a clear sky, I can take a data point. And if I go out tonight and it's cloudy, there's no data point. And if I get called back to the emperor, Rudolph, I think was the emperor who had uh, actually set him up there. Um, it might not be the original emperor, but anyway, you know, if he calls you back to court, you go back to court. And so now you miss all those observational data. So it's, it's kind of not only is it interesting from the point of view of like spotty data so you have to do this thing where you have to fill in missing data right and then from there you could probably do something but i think it'd be really cool to actually do it we've we've thought about like could we pull this off we'd it'd be super fun to do it because that would be really awesome right if if you yeah, can I mean, in that case it's um probably a, i wouldn't be surprised if uh, uh you discover it easily because it's a matter of just uh putting them into some vector form and doing the vector yeah. difference, right? Yeah, that's right. So it yeah. should work. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, Google may have uh, some some resources for that, right? Yeah. Like yeah. OCR detection or something that may work. Right? That would be amazing. All right, um, any other questions from the audience? All right, um, maybe I can ask just one question that I had, um, uh, which was about the, the Fourier um, uh, decomposition that you talked about, which was fascinating. Um, but, uh, so, and you, you talked about how tameable um, sine cosines are, um, even when we get to infinities. Now, do you see that, uh, do you see some connection between that and perhaps using sine and cosine as activation functions in, in a general neural network, will it help us avoid the vanishing gradient problems and other challenges too? Yeah, you know, it's interesting you ask that because it, it, could, it could very well be that using something like sines and cosines in the activation functions will give us some flexibility that we don't currently have with like ReLU's or SWISH or any of these activation functions that we are currently working with. Yeah. Um, we haven't played with that at all. You know, and, and mostly what we were just saying is, you know, I always think pretty simple. Like a lot of the things that I do, if you actually look at it, it goes, all he did was like try, he, you know, the criticisms, didn't he just kind of do something very similar to a Fourier transform? So yeah, <laughs> and, and I just had a little bit of modification and, but that's actually kind of powerful, right? So a lot of our inspiration goes back to a lot of methods that have been around for a long time that people were doing by hand. And if you say, well, my targeted use of neural net can take your by hand calculation and just do some funny, some nice little thing, touch ups to it, something you could never do by hand, but now you're still using these philosophical things like philosophically how you do want to do this forecast, which is the Fourier with a little touch up. And I think what's always been surprising to me is how well it works like and it's not because i did something smart what i i just did stuff that people have always done but now with a little help of a neural net 
And so it's, it's kind of this interesting thing, right? So it makes me think a lot about like, when we look at about all our techniques we developed through the 1800s, 1900s for doing the things we do, we should just really look carefully at them again, because these people were really smart and they had a lot of intuition because they spent a lot more time than we did thinking and trying to build intuition, right? Whereas we can just say data, you know, here's this many lines of TensorFlow. I mean, <laughs> do we really have to introspect? Mm -hmm. And I think the introspection that they did, they came up with really good methods that now if we bring the neural nets over, use their introspection, I think we can get a, a, good, a good models. Great, great. Uh, I, I don't want to hold your time uh, longer. There, there seems to be a raised hand. Um, would you have time for one more question? Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Joshua, I, I think you have a raised hand. Do you have a question? Oh yeah, sure. Thanks. So uh, I have a side question. So it's a, basically, I recently read a paper called Fourier Neural Operators, and yep. it seems to be quite related to what you're saying. So I'm just wondering whether you have some comments on it and the method you're, you're, you're using. Yeah, actually, the Fourier Neural Operator is really interesting. It, it, normally, I think, of, I think the Fourier Neural Operator, again, it goes, I think it builds on a, a really solid theme of what we, one way we solve PDEs is through spectral methods, right? We, we take PDEs, we project them into Fourier domain, and then we use these spectral techniques to advance the solution forward in time. And yeah. what neural PD, this neural operators do with Fourier is, is exactly that, but they just say like, but now that I have it in this space, I'm not gonna constrain myself to OD4.5. I can build maps to the future. I can build kernels to the future. I'm using the right, again, they're using, exploiting this amazing representation that we've known about forever. But now they say, yeah, but now I don't have this constraint of an ODE solver that I normally did. I can just simply have some kernel integration. It, so I love it because it's, it's a step up of us thinking about how do we do PDE integrations? And they're just saying, well, use a targeted use of a neural network the right way I'm still building on the same theme, but now I've got extra power because I'm allowing more flexibility because of the neural net. So I think you're gonna see more and more of these techniques evolve, right? And again, if you look at some of the original works of where neural, that neural operator came from, the original paper, they, it was very close actually to looking at Green's functions, right? Which was, they were looking at saying, okay, if I want a projection of the future state, I could imagine just integrating against a kernel to get there. That's, that's the entire concept of the Green's function. And they said, okay, well, instead of getting the Green's function, let me just take data and learn this kernel. So, and then from there, they went to learning kernels like Fourier kernels. So again, I love the fact that you tie it back to this classical technique that we learned how to really solve hard problems with. And now you say, take that classical technique, but now give it the power of the neural net to do things that you couldn't do by hand. Right or with linear math, right? You you now you're letting it do nonlinear and stuff. So, so that's a good place to look. Any you just go back, go back in time and just see what did people do? I bet I can do better with 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 these neural net touch ups. And uh, so it's anyway. And I think that's and we're finding that over and over again, right? It's not just they did it once, they did it twice. We're seeing it all over the place. Is that people are finding that um, these what were classical motivated physics informed motivations for what they did but they were, we were so constrained by linearity. Now you say like, take those constraints off, I can make everything work, awesome. Yeah, wonderful, thank you so much. Yeah, so I, by the way, I just have to say, you know, uh, for you guys who are young, this is like the best time ever to be in math and science. I mean, it's amazing, you know, it's amazing what's happening. And uh, it, it, it's never been a better time right now. I mean, it's, 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 I it just, it's so ex super exciting. I'm just sad. I'm, I'm as old as I am because <laughs> I'm going to die before I see all this stuff come through, but you guys might live for quite a while and see the full fruit of all this stuff. Right. So it's going to be fantastic. Yeah. Thanks for finding the comment. I really appreciate it. It's really fun working with uh, physics and yeah. machine learning and neural networks. It's very exciting. Thank you. Good. All right. Let's, let's thank Professor Katz again for the wonderful presentation. Um, and for sticking around with us uh, for extra time. Um, so folks, uh, we'll be um, taking a short break and we'll reconvene at 3.20. Thank you. <laughs>